Hello and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher. This is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Paul Jarvis. He's back on the show to talk about his brand new book, Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. And this isn't just about, hey, how can we make our companies not grow? Or why is minimalism a virtue inside of business and other things that you might have, you know, thought wise when it comes to this conversation? That's not it. Although we do touch on that. But it's more about deciding what success is. It's more about deciding what's most important in your life and in your business. And it's really about growing your business not just size-wise or money-wise, but growing it in the right way for the right reasons. In other words, being rich from the things that really matter in terms of fulfillment in your career and not just in terms of growing your business for the sake of growing your business because everyone says you should be growing your business and do it just like them, etc. So it's a really fun conversation. Uh, I I really enjoyed having Paul on the show and I'm definitely going to have him back soon. This is all about having a better, smarter business. And it doesn't just have to be small businesses that learn from this conversation. You could be in a bigger business and really learn a lot from this book. I am completely convinced. So anyway, uh, I'll get out of the way and just say, enjoy this conversation with Paul Jarvis. This week, I'm welcoming back Paul Jarvis to the show. It's been too long, but welcome back. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's been... (laughs) I, I yeah. don't know. I don't know whether to feel good or bad about anything anymore, really. Both. 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 I feel good <laughs> and bad about you being back on the show, Paul. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, gosh. But the funny story is, is I saw you tweet out about this book that you were coming out with, and I immediately said, that looks like an amazing book. I need to have you back on the show. Made a note to get in touch with you, and then the person that was promoting it for you or re- doing the reach out like had already reached out to me within a half an hour before I even got to reach out the other way. So it was meant to be. I'm super excited to talk about this, though. And the book is called Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. I hope the emphasis on the word small there <laughs> was helpful. This is contradictory to a lot of things a lot of people see when they look at the online space and look to their favorite entrepreneur that's, quote, killing it. So what is a company of one, first off, and then we'll dig into this a little bit deeper as to why, you know, this is the same old thing for you. You make your own rules, and I like that mm-hmm. you're, you're putting this out there. Yeah. So I think to define a company of one, I would say it can be a business of any size. First of all, I don't technically run a one person business. (laughs) I think it'd be hard. Like you would have to be much smarter than I am to be good at everything. But I think the the point of a company of one is that they question growth Mm -hmm. because not all growth is good. Not all growth is beneficial. And in fact, some growth is detrimental. And so I think if we start to think about growth as being, hmm, let me consider this instead of let me 10x all the things at all times forever and ever. I think we can get to uh, much better decisions about where we want our business to go and what we want our business to actually do. That was the thing I wanted to clear up first and foremost was this whole idea of the title being company of one. For a lot of people, that right there conjures up this idea of this made up word, which is a mishmash of, of other words, solopreneur. Uh, I have a pet peeve that involves m- mashing words together, especially when it's the word entrepreneur with anything else, like solopreneur, shoepreneur. You do it in the book, though. You you name intrapreneur. We'll talk about that one later. That one I'm not. <laughs> that one I'm not as opposed to. But it's almost like when um when crises, political crises, come out, everything then becomes something something gate. You know, yep. it's like, geez, come on, people, just name it by what it's named. Anyway, tangent, Uh, the whole point being, yes, that was the pet peeve I was going to have with you (laughs) before uh, I read the book, was this idea of, you know, we don't have to be a one-man band, in other words, and be a master of everything in order to function, because that's not productive, that's not healthy, and honestly, even in the type of growth that you're talking about not doing (laughs) in this book... It's not necessarily possible, really, you know, as a one person 
team as a as a solopreneur where it's only you and then you're killing it and then you make it you know eventually no you kind of need allies you you need teammates even if that comes in the form of other uh you know people you've networked with etc not necessarily just employees so for sure i'm sorry not many people have out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean not many people have law degrees either and um, legal stuff is kind of important in, in business for the most part. Same with accounting. I know how to make money. I don't know how to <laughs> pay my government the least amount of money possible while still doing everything legal. And I, I think that even just looking at those two examples, is a, it's a great example of how you can't just do it. Just because you work for yourself doesn't mean you have to work by yourself. I think that's probably a line from the book. At least I hope it's a line from the book because it sounds it sounds really nice. It is now. I'm going to make sure to make that, that the tweetable for this episode. <laughs> so, but ultimately, you're you're talking about something that really does feel contradictory to what a lot of people think is the point of becoming an becoming an entrepreneur and running your own business versus working for somebody else. And it's this idea of having freedom and being able to do whatever you want. But in the end, what you're saying is no, in order to become an entrepreneur and maintain that freedom, you need to question this growth in all areas for all reasons. Uh, in other words, having this staying small as an end goal is something that a lot of people aren't necessarily going to consider unless they hear it from somebody who's got experience like you do. Yeah. And I mean, I think it uh, it all comes down to kind of like what we see out there, like what examples we have out there. And I think that the media and the entrepreneurial space and even just the business space kind of shows one idea or one example of what business success is. And it's the like, <clears throat> excuse me, the Elon Musk's or the Mark Zuckerberg's of the of the world who just have these like massive companies, massive empires who probably making tons of money, but it just looks one certain way. And I was just like, what if I don't want that? <laughs> like, <laughs> what if I don't want to testify in front of Congress? What if I don't want to have a couch in my office like Musk does because I don't have time to actually sleep or see my family? Like, what if I don't, what if I don't want those things? What if I don't want to hustle like 24 seven? What if I just want to have a business that supports the life that I want so I can not have to focus on the business at all hours of the day? What if I wanted to find my own version of success? And what if I want to move towards that instead of moving towards a version of success I don't actually want? Because one of two things will happen in that case. I'm either going to achieve it, in which case I've achieved something I don't want, or I'm not going to achieve it. And I'm going to feel like a failure for not achieving something I didn't want in the first place. Oh, <laughs> it gosh, seems like a lose-lose. Yeah, I was just going to say, that's a lose-lose. You you got what you didn't want, or you got it, and you didn't want it anyway. <laughs> so what's the third route? Um, the, the third route is starting a business, uh, making decisions based on what you want. I think the term lifestyle business gets a bum rap because it's kind of defined in one way where you like – have a laptop on the beach and in the other hand you're sipping a, a Mai Tai or some kind of drink with like a, one of those little umbrellas in it. Do those still exist anymore? I, I I'm sure know. they do. I, they I probably know. do. But that's not what I want. So I don't want to go after that either. That's not success for me. Yeah. I mean, also sand and laptops don't mix. Like oh, wow, yeah. Getting sand and technology just isn't a good thing. And I think uh, that version of lifestyle business doesn't appeal to people. Even people like Tim Ferriss, who wrote Four Hour Work Week, nowhere in the book does it say you only have to work four hours. Like that's not the point <laughs> of the book. And so I think having, I think every business is a lifestyle business. I think that regardless of what you do for work, it comes with a certain lifestyle. If you work nine to five at a corporate job, then you have a lifestyle based on that because you're work. You have your butt in a chair from nine to five, Monday to Friday. If you work at a like venture backed startup, you have a very specific life where your investors are probably going to want you to work and not sleep 99% of the time unless they're smarter investors. And so I think if we think, if we think about, okay, if we're going to work for ourselves, if we want to do that and we want to be entrepreneurs, not solopreneurs or mom entrepreneurs or whatever other mashup that there is, it's yes. all just entrepreneur. It's all just entrepreneur. It, it really if you want is. to be an entrepreneur, yeah. So if we want to do that, then based on the life that we want, how can we shape our business around that? So it's a lifestyle business that makes sense. 
And I think if we start to think about, well, if that's what a lifestyle business is, that actually sounds kind of appealing. And even if we're not sitting on a beach sipping my time, I also don't like the sun. <laughs> Just Gosh, so, dude. I don't want to sit in the sun. Like I maybe want to get a couple minutes of sun, but then I don't want to sit on the beach all day lying in the sun. But I think like if I think about, okay, what's important to me? What's important in my life? Why did I start my business in the first place? What's the purpose of it? What do I want out of it? Then we can start making better decisions. And sometimes that means not growing. Like sometimes that means saying, I don't actually want this. Even if everybody else in the world or everybody else in my life is saying, well, if you're succeeding, you should be growing. And if you're not growing, you're not succeeding. It's like, what if I don't want that? And I decided a long time ago that I don't want that. I don't want to promote myself, for example, out of a job I like doing. If I hired a staff of 20 to do the writing and designing I do, then my days would be taken up managing people doing the job I wish I was doing. And I would just be jealous. <laughs> I don't want to run a business that are just jealous all the time of my staff. I just want to keep doing the work that I actually like doing. I love spending my day writing. I love spending my day designing. So that's what I want to do. And I want to optimize for that life as opposed to just growing in all directions at all times and ending up with a life I don't like or a business I don't like. Oh, yeah. See, and there's the danger right there is when people jump ship out of the, you know, or whatever, take the leap, whatever metaphor you need to, <laughs> to insert here for you to understand that you step out on your own as an entrepreneur, there's this sudden pressure that now that thing, whatever it is you're doing to that, that is going to bring in money instead of the paycheck that was steady and consistent and constant. It's now has this pressure on it and you don't want to, uh, beat it to death or have it, you know, be boring or, uh, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and I think there's a certain amount of stress on it to grow it so that it can sustain itself, right? Yeah. I mean, society says that in order to have a quote unquote legitimate business, it needs to look a certain way. And it's like, if I tell a person that I meet on the street, which would be weird, I don't meet that many people on the street. It'd be weird if I was just like <laughs> walking up to strangers telling them what I do. But like if I if I met somebody for the first time and I said, "Hey, I I what do you?" and the the inevitable question of what do you do comes up. And instead of just like shrinking back into some shrubbery like that there's a Homer Simpson gif of him doing that. Yes. If I answered that question and I said, well, I, I run a business and I have like a thousand employees across 14 offices in three countries. That sounds pretty cool. If I told them like what actually my life is where I sit at home and I work by myself in my office in sweatpants or pajamas. That doesn't sound as good, but it doesn't sound as good to another person who I don't like. It doesn't really matter what they think. Like I actually really like sitting in my office in my pajamas or my Costco sweatpants and working quietly like that to me is like, I'm happy doing those things. So does it really matter what somebody else thinks business should look like? And I don't think I don't think it does. Even when I started, like I started doing this in the 90s when freelancing wasn't even a thing, when working for yourself wasn't much of a thing. And people were like, well, I don't understand what you do. Like you quit your job. So what are you going to do for work? And I would tell them, like, I work for myself and I do things on the computer for clients in different countries. And they're like, but I don't understand that. Like, well, are you going to start another agency? Because I worked at an agency. They're like, well, are you going to start another agency? And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. And they're like, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm doing what I think is best. And if it's profitable and if it's sustainable, then I just want to keep doing that. Well, and I think some listeners would say, but aren't you an agency of one to do a flip <laughs> on the title of the book? Yeah, I mean, it depends. Like, I think that the the kind of agency model is kind of different from what I do because I think agencies specifically are very service-based, like they work with clients. I don't really do any service stuff anymore. Like all I do, like I, I make and I sell products. So it kind of different, but I mean, like you could call it anything. Like I don't really yeah. even care if yeah. people are want to be like, oh, I have an agency of one. I'd be like, awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> we don't need to get stuck <laughs> on semantics. In other words, it's not that no. big of a deal. We so. don't need to be semantic printers. Oh, here. wow. Well done. <laughs> title of the show. Maybe. No, I'm kidding. I don't title the show that way, but it would be cool if I did. <laughs> oh, gosh. See, and that's the thing. I, well, actually, to go back to semantics, we're talking about the word growth. I think there's a couple different ways people could take that because growth for its own sake 
if it's necessary, is a good thing. But growth, well, no, no, no. Growth for its own sake is not a good thing. Growth for growth's sake. But growth for a reason, say, you know you need to grow to a little bit larger or a little bit more profitability, whatever you want to call it, for the sake of sustaining the choices that you have made intentionally, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, I and I, I think that I think it all comes down to the way we think about growth at different stages. Because like I would never say that I'm anti growth because when we start a business, we start at zero, and at least most of us do. So we all need to grow to have enough revenue, have enough customers or clients, have enough um, of a lot of things to make the business sustainable. So we all start and require this growth mindset. We all like that's how it all begins because we have to go from zero to one or zero to enough. But then there comes a point if we're doing well, which hopefully that happens at some point, where the growth doesn't serve us anymore. But if we've only had this mindset that growth is good because at the time in the beginning, growth is good, if we don't ever question that, then we're never going to stop. We're never going to say, like, hey, do I have enough? We're always going to be, well, I needed growth. In the past, growth was good. I needed to make a certain amount to cover all of my bases. I needed a certain number of customers to generate that revenue. I needed a certain audience size. If we don't ever question that, if we don't ever question like, hey, maybe there's a point where I have enough and I can focus on optimizing instead of growth, then I think we're doing our business as a disservice. And I think that, that, I think that that's, that's what happens a lot of times. Is this even un- unconscious where we don't necessarily think we've adopted a growth mindset forever. We're not conscious of that, but that's kind of what happens because we all start and have to go from zero to one. We all have to grow to enough. But then if we reach enough, we can then, things can, things can actually change. And I think that's kind of the point of the book is that, hey, if we determine what enough is and it's different for each of us, it's different for every business, just like success is different for everyone in every business. If we decide, okay, well, this is what enough is. And if I hit this, then I can optimize for it. Then I think we can make better choices in our business and we can have businesses that, that are much more sustainable. In the book, you talk about this type of growth, but you talk about it as traits of what a company of one uh, has. In other words, there's four traits, this resilience, this autonomy, the speed, and the simplicity. And when I look at the four of those put together, and I think we should spend a little bit of time talking about those each individually, but sure. when I look at them all, all four of them put together, I see this other kind of growth. And I see it as a growth of, say, maturity. Mm-hmm. So, Which is funny, because I'm not mature at all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maturity in terms of, say, making the right choices, being, Mm -hmm. you know, having wisdom, having wisdom that has come from experience, even, Um, especially when I look at the the, of the four traits, the one that really stands out to me is this, this simplicity, and how to a lot of people, that word would be the opposite of growth, where simplicity, when we talk about simplicity, which is very similar to say, minimalism, which is all about Mm -hmm. like, Getting rid of things somewhat. Minimalism isn't just about getting rid of things. It's about having the right things. It's not about getting rid of everything. It's about getting rid of excess, things you don't need, uh, and paring down. That's where it kind of connotates this anti-growth um you know, mo- motion or, a, you know, it's it's a, instead of growing, you're scaling back. But again, scaling back might actually be growth in a weird, mature way. Does that make sense? It 100% does. So I think there's a few points there. I think the if, if we decide what is simple or what is enough um, or what is like the minimum amount, like I think a lot of times in business, we focus on the sexy things like the gross profit, for example. Like when companies talk about um, financials, they talk about the gross profit. But I think that that's such a vanity metric. Like if I say, oh, I made a million dollars a year and I didn't actually make a million dollars a year. But if I said, hey, I made a million dollars a year, that sounds really sexy. That sounds really good. But if it took me, if it, if I had to spend $900,000 to make a million dollars, I didn't really, at the end of the day, make a million dollars. I made a hundred grand. So if I could instead, say, ma- work towards making like $300,000, but only spend 50, in fact, I've actually, I, I, my margins are better. I've actually yeah. taken home more profit in that case. And it, 
we can be it can be a lot more simple to make less money at a higher profit than it is to make a lot of money in when you have to spend a lot of money and i think minimal and i mean like i guess i kind of consider myself a minimalist like if you looked at my house and the lack of furniture you would probably say that i am a minimalist <laughs> Like taking away what you want and kind of living in hardship. I think it's about, it's just like I was talking about with business. I think it's figuring out what is enough and not really going past that. And I mean, for myself, for running a very simple, minimal business, I try, like that to me creates certain freedoms. So the first is um, freedom from excess financial worry, because if I'm spending less, it takes less for me to become profitable, like we just talked about. Um, freedom from the stress of being busy. So if I have a very simple, minimal business, I'm not busy all the time. And I think in our society, we kind of mentally reward people who are busy, like, oh, they must be successful. They're really busy. And to me, it's like, I don't actually want to be busy all the time. It's okay to be busy sometimes. But if I'm busy all the time, then I feel like that's going to lead to stress. That's going to lead to burning out. That's going to, that's really just me. I Like if I'm busy, I'm not prioritizing my life properly. And yes. that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. If, if I'm busy a little bit, then that's fine. If I'm always busy, if that's the default state, then I'm doing something wrong. Yes. The, the, if default mode is the switch is switched over to hustle at all times, <laughs> then something's wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with the word hustle. I think there's something wrong with the switch always being switched over to that setting, yes. though. Yep. Yeah. If that's, the, if that's the default state, then that's hard. There's... um some TV show about app developers and that I can't remember what the quote was, but the guy was talking about how he's so busy. He doesn't have time to like see his kids or his family. And I'm like, is that like, are you really hustling smart there, dude? Like that just doesn't seem, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem right to me. That doesn't seem like, I don't know why it would work. Like if I was so busy that I couldn't have any life outside of work, I, like that to me doesn't seem successful. That to me doesn't seem like I'm I've, I've prioritized correctly in my life. Yeah, I, I'd have to question like, at what point do you get to the point where you realize that the worth that you're getting out of life is just, you know, what you've plugged into, what you've hardwired into your brain as to it, wrongly, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. that that is providing that that benefit that is providing that worth in your life. <laughs> like, at what point do you realize, hey, there's nothing coming through the pipes here, you know? Yeah, Ugh. it doesn't. Yeah, it just it, it it doesn't make sense. I mean, like I've been there like in my 20s when I was stupid for lots of reasons, not just <laughs> this. I was like, well, maybe I'll be a success if I make a million dollars a year. So if I'm not working, I'm not making money. Therefore, if I'm always working, I'm always making money. I'm always working towards this million dollar goal. But I mean, like it was dumb because one like I didn't need a million dollars. Like it just would have been something nice to achieve. It was a goal that had no value attached to it other than like ego, I guess would be the value attached to it. But I like, I don't need to work all hours of the day. Like if I know it doesn't even seem smart to me. And I also think that, um, I mean, you know a lot more about productivity than I do, but it, it feels like sometimes work takes up the space we give it. So yes. if we give ourselves like, nine to five, our work is probably going to take eight hours. If we give ourselves like nine to nine or nine to midnight, we're probably going to fill that with work. If we give ourselves less time, we experiment with like, maybe I only need to work like four or five hours a day. Or maybe for myself, like I only have, I can only get a certain amount of like very mindful work done. Like I, I can probably max out at about two, three hours of like writing or designing or coming up with like really intensely creative stuff. And then I probably have a couple more hours where I could do like admin work or just work on my business instead of in my business. But past that, I feel like I just can't get more done in that time or it's not the best use of my time. So I'd rather come back at it another day. Well, and then the freedom there is if you're really good, you go the opposite direction of not just, yeah. you know, eight to, you know, 11 or 12 at night. You say, hey, I challenge myself to this. What if I went from eight to noon and ate lunch? Yeah. And then if by the time I'm eat, sitting and eating lunch and relaxing, I got done the things I needed to do because I said I only could work on them in the morning, yeah. you go see a movie. 
or something as a reward. I don't know. I'm throwing that out there. Yeah. It's like, but again, that's, there's the lifestyle. There's my lifestyle right there. I'd love to work in the morning and then have lunch and go see a movie. You just want to go see Bohemian Rhapsody every Again, afternoon. yes. That and like <laughs> Creed 2 and maybe once my kids got home. I don't know. Anyway, that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I guess that's that's where I'm at is there's this idea that you have to be on at all times and that's just wrong. And not only that you have to be on, but then you have to have others that are working for you and they have to be on and, and on and on call all times. And, you know, that that that's not necessarily what this is about, really. That's I mean, again, it's it's all about calling into question. I know what it was. You said earlier, you said this idea of, you know, that that a measure of success would be uh, making a million dollars and that that was not necessarily what you wanted. But honestly, and it popped into my head at the time you were saying it, well, that essentially a lot of people have that goal. It's not their goal. They adopted Mm -hmm. someone else's goal. Yeah. Without questioning it. Yeah. And I mean, even if you like if I reach that. I don't even know what would happen. Like, what would happen? Like, there's not like comp- confetti is not going to like fall from the ceiling magically. <laughs> I mean, you could buy bank some. Account. You'd have enough I, money I to could. do so. But I again, could. even as, even as you were saying earlier, it's probably not going to be a hundred. Sorry, it's not going to be a million dollars pure profit either. Yeah, exactly. So. And I mean, that's the thing. Like, I I know how much I I need to kind of make that requires the least amount of expenses to, to reach it. And I, I'm happy with that. Like I'm happy with that level of responsibility where like, I don't need to venture into paid acquisition or advertising because my business generates enough, like basically pure profit at this point where I could do those things and I could generate more revenue, but it would be t- a ton more work. It would cost a ton more. It, the growth in that sense wouldn't, wouldn't make any sense to me. Yeah. It, and that, at that point, Growth doesn't make any sense. And I guess really that's what we're calling into question. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's all about having that right mindset when it is approaching, you know, whether you're just getting started or you've been doing it for a long time and you're listening to this and you're like, yeah, you know what? I've never really questioned my goals here. You know, I've just been doing this, quote, follow my passion thing that people start off with. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I, I don't think pa- I don't think passion is the first thing. I think passion follows um, getting good at something and testing something out. I think like I'm I was never passionate about being a writer, so I started to write books. I just saw that writing was something that was working for me, and then I tested it a little bit, and I was like, oh, I'm making money writing, and now I can write another book, and now I can write another book, and and then and now I like I love writing. Same with design. Like when I started 20 years ago, I didn't have, like, it wasn't my goal. And it pisses so many writers off saying that, like, it was never my goal to to be a writer. But, like, I'm super passionate about it now because it's something that I've worked at. It's something I've tested out. It's something that I, I've developed as a skill because it seemed like, like, if I was, if, if I was just doing writing as a hobby, then passion would be something that would guide me. It's just like, if you want to play ukulele or skydive, you should probably be passionate about those things, especially if you're going to jump out of a plane. You probably need to have some passion about like wanting to jump out of the plane. But if it's work, it's like it, it, passion doesn't need to guide everything. This whole follow your passion thing, it, like everybody would just be getting paid somehow to watch Netflix all day. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't even know how you would get paid to do that. But like I would rather just like do the work, focus on the work, focus on like – enjoying helping other people seeing that what i'm doing is valuable enough for other people to pay for and then as i do that for a while i tend to get passionate about the things that i that i do that pay off um in terms of like mindset personally and feeling value but also pay off in terms of profit because we're still talking about business and a lot of times people are like oh it's okay to have like to think small like if you don't want to make money it's like no i I I love making money. (laughs) Making money is a very important part of business. I think the more that you can work towards your business being profitable, the more that it can continue indefinitely. Like businesses that are profitable don't go out of business. Businesses that are generating a ton of revenue but have very tiny margins or no margins at all, like Pets.com in the early 2000s (laughs) with Super Bowl ads and stuff when they were selling things below their cost, businesses like that go out of business. 
So I think having goal, like it's like people are always like, well, isn't that like a self-limiting belief that you want to stay small? And I don't think that it is. I think that it's one, knowing like, like we've been talking about what makes sense to me. And two, I think that there's this, like, it's funny how the world works now where a lot of things aren't based in truth or fact. <laughs> yes. I won't even get into, I won't even get into some of that. Yep. But I think in business, we're told by people like on stage giving keynotes that like 10x this or growth hack this or growth is always good. But like when I started, because I've spent years writing this book now and looking at data and that like there's a lot of research in the book. And a lot of the research shows that unchecked growth or rapid growth or growth without purpose is detrimental and, and leads to companies going out of business. And there's st- like Startup Genome Project did a study of 3,200 um, high growth companies and found that 74% of them failed, not because of competition or business plan, but because they scaled too fast. Kauffman Institute looked at the Inc. 5000 list five to eight years later, this list that all of these businesses want to get on and found that two thirds of them had gone out of business. These were like the best companies <laughs> at the time. Like two thirds of them had gone out of business, sold below market value, or had massive layoffs, basically confirming that growth isn't always a, a smart thing. But like if we look at Instagram or like articles on business magazines, it's like growth, growth, growth. We need growth, growth. And it's like, have you looked at some facts, bro? Because <laughs> it doesn't, like, it just doesn't, it doesn't line up. Like, the, the data doesn't support what people are saying. And I was like, well, what if we actually look at the data? Like, what if we find truth in, like, studies of more than just, and I think part of the problem is that a few people have seen great success from rapid growth. And, and But it's basically like an N of one situation. Like, I got successful because I did this thing. Therefore, what I did is a blueprint when really it's just, this is what the data set is too small. <laughs> this is what one yes. person did one time to achieve one. something. A study of yes. one. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that we need to look at a bigger data set. And like, if we do that, and if we actually look at studies on business, we see that growth isn't always the best. Growth isn't always, is rarely the best idea if we're just growing for the sake of growth. I kept, I keep picturing talking about rapid growth as almost just like just being in college and putting on that freshman 15, you know, and getting fat instead of growing muscle tissue and agility and, you know, things that are actually important. Yeah, I mean, it's funny in in Buddhism, there's kind of this concept of of this hungry ghost and it's basically that the more you feed this creature, the more hungry it gets. And I think a lot of like this doesn't even just apply to business. I think this applies to so many things in life where there's so many times where we think that we'll be happy in the future if we do this thing and then we do it and we're not happy. So we think that, oh, well, I just need to do more of that thing. Mm-hmm. And then it just it just spirals it just spirals out of control. Like the, the the point of the hungry ghost is that it won't get full by feeding it. It just gets more and more hungry by feeding it. <laughs> and I think that yeah, like even if 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 we go back to what you were just saying, like if we look at um, like calories and food, like if we look at filling ourselves up with with calories from whole foods, then we're going to be full a lot faster. Like how many times when you eat fast food? Are you just not full or you're full for like five minutes and then you're like, mm, maybe I should go back to the counter. Like I haven't even left the restaurant yet. Maybe I just go back to the counter and get another burger because it's not, it's not satiating, satiating, satiating. You, you <laughs> were right the ones. first time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I mean, that's exactly what it is. And, and, and again, talking about satiating, like that's that going back to that person who's hustling and working all hours, but never seeing their family. It's empty calories. Yeah. The, the hours they're putting in are empty calories, basically. Yeah, and those so. can taste good. Like, I definitely, I haven't had fast food for 10 years because I'm vegan, but there's a restaurant in Canada that now has uh, Beyond Meat, like a yes. like a fake meat burger. Yeah. I was like, let's try some fast food. It was tasty, but again, like, I was not full for very long after trying it. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to make sure that people hear us, that we are not saying making more money is a bad thing by, you know, by any means or or not by any means is making more money a bad thing. If that's the goal, because it allows you to reach those other goals that you yourself have chosen. We're just Mm -hmm. saying like, 
question what goals you've already put in place or what subconsciously you're aiming at when it comes to having, you know, set your defaults. Yeah, I mean, there was a study done by Pew uh, in the States that found that people actually are happier as they make more money, but up to a certain point. I, th- I can't remember what the, the number was. I think it was like seventy four, seventy eight thousand dollars It doesn't even matter. Right. They were happy up until they reached a certain point because more money, if you don't have enough money, gives you the means to cover your bases and the, the means to not stress out about money because money can be stressful. But then the study also found that past a certain point, People are actually more unhappy the more that they made. So I think it's finding that like the juicy middle where you're you've got what you need covered, but it's not costing you so much to keep going and it it's not costing you so much in terms of resources or expenses or or personnel or infrastructure to keep going. Like I think it makes sense to kind of figure figure that out. And it's different for everybody. Like one of my buddies has four kids. Like what he needs to bring home is a lot more than what I need to bring home because I don't have kids. And so I think even people that li- like people that live in San Francisco versus somebody like me who lives in the woods on an island, like my cost of living is not as high. And so I think it's, it's important to kind of figure it out for yourself a little bit and and kind of figure out like what that sweet spot is, because I think that um, there can be there can be enough. And I think that, like I definitely, like I said, I definitely love making money, but I wouldn't love if making money required a lot, like to make 10% more, if it required 50% more work, it yes. doesn't make sense. If it required 50% more responsibility, <laughs> that would not make sense for me. So I think that there's like, it's about finding that nice middle ground, that like top of the bell curve where it's not, it's not like falling off on either side into badness. You're familiar with the, the the whole principle of the the fulcrum and the the lever, and mm-hmm. where you adjust the lever to where it is on the fulcrum, so that you can, you know, put a lot less effort down for a lot more output. Yeah, and to me, that's that's the illustration of what I kind of strive to go after when I'm talking about productivity. It's it's not necessarily about being busy or or getting more done. It is about getting more done, but it's actually more over about getting more impact made for either the same amount of effort I'm already doing, having that have more output, or for me to put less output, no, sorry, for me to put more, for me to put less effort into it and get the same amount or more out. Yeah, so yeah. And I mean, that's, that's a good point. And I mean, even when I start, when I shifted my business from service-based client work to product, I figured, so one, I kept my income stream separately so I could see how each was doing. But the, the, what I was kind of moving towards was it, my product business will be considered a success to me if I can make as much as my service business did, because my service business did really well. If I put in less work to make the same amount of money, it would be a success. It wouldn't be a success if I had to put in more work to make the same amount of money or the same work. So I actually like doing client work. So I mean, I think it, it's good to kind of consider all, all kind of all of the all of the sides, even outside of talking just about finances. Like for me, I know what the right audience size for me is. And if I'm speaking specifically for something like my mailing list, I know that the size that it's at, that's 30,000 people. I, if, I know that the size that it's at they're going to like they generate enough revenue for me to make my business profitable, which is great. And I, I love that. But if my audience grew too much, then when I send an email, it's called my list is called the Sunday dispatchers, which makes sense because I send emails on Sunday and I get a couple hundred replies um, every Sunday when I send out an email. If my if my audience was like a million people and I got thousands of replies or 10 million people and I got thousands of replies, I'd lose that connection with them. And that connection, I really, so one, I really like that connection. Two, it, it really guides me. Like I think business is about serving other people well because they're giving you money to do it. So I feel like it, it, because my audience is the size that it's at and I don't really work at, like I don't work at growing my list anymore because I don't, other than to offset the churn, it doesn't make sense sure. because I like that I can have a conversation with all the people that want to have a conversation with me. I like that I can learn from them just as much as they're learning from me. I like that I can kind of see, okay, there's a pattern here. This is what people want. This is something I know how to do. So maybe this can be a paid product that I can offer because I know that this is kind of what 
a bunch of people on my list are struggling with. And I like that I can have that interaction and I can learn directly from them as opposed to having to send out an email that's like no reply at domain name. And if somebody replies, it just goes into a void. Like I know what enough is for me, not just in terms of money, but in terms of like audience and in terms of most things. But I think that's a great example of finding that kind of good middle ground yeah, that's a great example. I'm glad that you you gave that example because again, and I'm glad that we again made the disclaimer of one making more money is not bad. Uh, it's it's all about knowing what enough is in mm-hmm. all these different areas, and I mean that's what the whole book is about. It's not just about knowing, but then it's also about executing, which is the really cool part. And you know, conveniently, I've left us talking about that kind of out of this conversation as we wrap up because I want people to go grab the book because. Personally, for me, this is all stuff that I'm soaking in and taking note of for myself personally. And, you know, I'll just say, you know, I endorse I verbally endorse this book right now on this this podcast and people really should go out and grab it. Uh, It's about to come out uh, as of this recording. We're recording this in 2018, but January 2019, as it's about to release, uh, is there anything uh, bonus wise or anything like that you want to point people towards to uh, go grab while they grab the book? Yeah. I mean, if they go to the website for the book of one.co, there's a bunch of bonuses on there. There's, a, I guess, a bonus podcast for the book. If it's on pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts called Company of One, where I share a few stories from the book. I share a few um, audio interviews and audio snippets from people that I interviewed for the book, like Jason Freed, Danielle Laporte, um, Laura Roeder, um, the Studio Neat guys, Dan Provost, and and a few other people. And I think, yeah, it's just a, and I, I want to continue having conversations like um, the conversation in the book, like the conversation you and I just had about, hey, maybe this thing that is so prevalent um, in our space, maybe it doesn't have to be right, or maybe it isn't right for everybody. And I think that that's important because I think if if new entrepreneurs or people who want to be entrepreneurs see only one way to do things, then I think we're doing them a disservice because we may be putting people off who could make a make an impact on the world or could just do something that they're that they really like and that their customers really like, and they could be doing it in a way that is that isn't talked about and is different from the way. Um, the way that we see it, even there's a chapter in the book about leadership. And my, my editor was like, do we need this chapter? Because it doesn't really make sense with the book. And I was like, well, it, it actually really does make sense yeah, it does. because I think, especially for leadership, we see like on TV, we see the, like the leader is always a dude for some reason. They're always like an A type personality that was yell a lot for some reason, I guess, cause it's TV and it needs to be drama. And it's like, well, I'm not, that kind of leader. Like I'm a very quiet, introverted, socially awkward person. There's a lot of leaders who are female or not, <laughs> not just white people being leaders. And I think that the more that we can show that leadership looks like a lot of different things, the more we can have like a, a diverse group of leaders. And I mean, diversity one is good, but also it positively impacts the bottom line of companies in so many ways that it's, it's just, it's a good idea to show people that it doesn't have to look like one specific thing, whether it's running a company, being a leader or anything else in the world. Well said. And yes, leadership is a huge part of this because again, that plays into the decision-making process, which is really what we're talking all about is this Mm -hmm. idea of making decisions for yourself instead of just accepting what somebody else has told you it has to be, or what the goals are for you based on their life and they may have accepted it from somebody else without questioning it and so on and so on. So uh, it's a good, it's a great book and everybody needs to go grab it and uh, I'll link up to the podcast and to what was the other thing you said? There was the other thing. Um, uh, the website, the website. One.co. yes, the, the, the website for the book itself and the podcast for the book, for the book. And um, Paul has been great talking with you again. Let's, have you come back sooner than <laughs> three years from now uh, and uh, keep keep the door open so we can keep doing that. So Sounds good, Eric. And thank you very much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. So what do you think in terms of growth? What's the right growth for you? I'm not sure. I'm still pondering this question. Uh, in fact, I'm pondering it in terms of different things that I'm doing with the show moving forward, the possibility of some other things coming along that work in tangent with the show. I'm not going to get into that right now, but uh, I, I want to say thank you again 
to Paul for stopping by and having this conversation. I really enjoyed having this conversation. I hope that you enjoyed listening in on this conversation, this this sit-down talk with, with Paul and I over coffee. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to share it with somebody while you're over there on the show notes. Again, beyond the to-do list.com. Hit the share button. Let somebody know about this conversation and what it meant to you. And uh, they can hopefully get something out of it too. Hey, so until next week, thanks for listening. And I'll see you next episode.